This week's episode of Trek Geeks is brought to you by Fansets, the place for amazing pinned collectibles. They have close to 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins to choose from with new pins coming out every month. See all the pins and collectibles they have to offer at fansets.com and stay tuned for this week's special Trek Geeks discount code. Fansets, we are Star Trek. Hi, this is Nana Visitor, Major Kira Norris from Deep Space Nine, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Gamma Quadrant, the Trek Geeks Podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. Podfleet Command. It's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Trek Geeks. I'm your co-host, Bill Smith. It's so great to have you all here. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for listening. It's amazing. I'm gesturing to my screen as if there's a camera that can see me and nobody can see me whatsoever. I feel like Kirk right now. Spunk. I need more power. Um, but yeah, welcome as I just ramble on into nothingness. Um, this is episode number 172. We're very excited to talk about this topic today. We like breaking out of the box and just talking about episodes and talking about some grander concepts in Star Trek, and that's what we're going to do today. And of course, by we, I do mean my illustrious co-host and myself. I can think of nobody I would rather have in that second seat other than about a dozen different people. But for now, the person occupying that chair is a relatively lukewarm body named Dan Davidson. Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. Thanks. Uh, good to have you here for now. It's good to be here for the time that I have remaining. I appreciate it very much. And so basically, you were calling me a nobody because I could see you gesturing like Captain Kirk, but yet you said nobody could see you. So uh, Your words, not mine. That. Yes, it's, uh, it's great to be here. As you said, we've got a very special topic to talk about this week, and uh, we're not going to talk about um, a particular episode or anything like that or, or a specific character per se, but, you know, the women of Star Trek... Uh, is a very important topic. And so we decided that we were going to, to have a very good discussion about that today. And it's one that I have been looking forward to for, for quite a while. So here we are. And I have a feeling this is going to be the first in a series of discussions about the women of Star Trek. We're going to talk today primarily about characters. But I mean, there are other discussions that have to happen outside of what we see on screen because women have played a pivotal role in Star Trek from its inception through its production right up until today and the celebrations of fandom that we have every single year. So we're going to kick it off today looking at some of the women we think are most important as characters in Star Trek. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, buddy. I'm very excited about it. You know, ever since the original series first aired, uh, there have been extremely strong women uh, in Star Trek, and it's gone all the way up through every series, every single movie, and now, of course, with Discovery, and it just keeps getting better and better, and it's about time. I think that's something that we'll also be talking about as uh, as the discussion progresses. But like you said, later on, we can talk about people behind the camera. We can talk about writers. We can talk about authors of books. There's just so many other areas, like you said, besides in front of the camera and it's a series of discussions that i i really can't wait to to do it's 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 really something i'm proud of uh same here there are so many women who deserve the recognition and the celebration is you know, for being a part of star trek and uh and it's something that we're long overdue in discussing so we're happy to do it today dan something else we're long overdue in talking about is how people can get in touch with us maybe they want to talk about some of the women they think made key contributions to star trek or maybe they just want to tell us how old we are because we are um how might they do that 
sir. Well, it's uh, it's very easy to do so. Just head right on over to trekgeeks.com slash contact, and there you'll find a variety of ways to get in touch with either Bill or myself. You can leave us a voicemail. You can Skype chat us. You can fill out the contact form and type us out a personalized message, or you can even click on that big, giant blue button on the right side of the website and leave us a message with your very own mellifluous voice using SpeakPipe. And don't forget, the place to be on Facebook these days is the Trek Geeks official Facebook group, Camp Kittimer. Bring your Trek talk, your Trek picks, and your Trek love over to the site and join over 1,300 other friends talking all things Trek and talking all things positive. Uh, don't forget, every Friday, it's the Friday Commute Celebration, where Bill and I will do our week weekly weekly well you could take i'm it. weeping right now yeah, i know you are um uh, lip sync especially for our campers <laughs> to, to join the group just head right on over to facebook.com slash groups slash camp kinemer and be ready to be part of a truly wonderful social experience as always we want to thank our wonderful admins Haley, jackie and dan for the amazing job they do running that camp uh but please 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 remember that any comments or messages that you leave us in any of these places, people, we may take it, we may use it in a future episode. You have been warned. Back to you, Bill. And any comments you make may make Dan cry. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. They're there. Okay. Dan, it's time for the news from treknews.net. <laughs> Spanning the Alpha Quadrant. <laughs> for all the news on all the Star Treks, yo. <laughs> it's treknews.net. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to pull a Michael ending. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. Sorry. Online at treknews.net. Dan, a little bit of news to talk about this week. Some exciting stuff. Some new stuff that, you know, just, some of it just came down just before we clicked the record button tonight. But up first, Star Trek Las Vegas, the event that is on so many Trekkies calendars every summer as we record this is now less than 130 days away. And creation is just continuing to add guests uh, on an almost weekly basis at this point. Yeah, they absolutely are. And the latest names, Bill, seem only logical. Hint, hint. Yes, three names from Discovery have been added to the annual Jaunt to the Desert in Nevada. First up, the wonderful and talented Rekha Sharma, who of course played Landry during season one of Discovery. She will be there. And on a related note, the Mirror Landry pin is now available from our fan uh, friends at Fansets, Bill. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, also added to the guest list is Sarek himself, Mr. James Frame, uh, which is very cool. And his son will be there. The one I am most excited about, Mr. Ethan Peck, who, of course, plays Spock in episode, uh, season two of Discovery, will be there. Uh, anyone who watches Disco or listens to Discovering Trek knows that he is absolutely killing it as Spock. And uh, we just can't wait to see him in Vegas. And, Bill, I just love making you laugh uncontrollably when I trip over my own tongue. Will, uh, will Leighton be there? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's inside joke. Uh, you'll have to listen to Discovering Trek this week to understand why I saw that. Um, you know, I, I love the guest announcements every year up ahead of STLV because it gives me a chance to get excited just about once a week, every week. Yeah. And, you know, there are always guests that I'm excited to see at STLV because, I mean, they're all there for the fans, which I think is ultimately what makes me the most you know happy about it. So right. um, I can't wait to see Ethan Peck. Uh, I can see you standing next to him with a photo being taken. Possibly, I'm no expert. I, I, it, it would only seem the, the the logical thing to do. That's getting old. I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, that's really old. Kind of like your, yeah, your, your face. Oh, um, Dan. Next up at uh, Paley Fest LA over the weekend, Alex Kurtzman gave us a little more insight into the upcoming Jean Luc Picard series, star, starring none other than Sir Patrick Stewart. Yes, he certainly did. And, uh, you know, I like how he can give us some information yet really tell us nothing. But uh, he did his best. And during the Discovery panel, Mr. Kurtzman dropped a couple of notable lines uh, regarding the upcoming series. Quote, it's going to be a very different show from Discovery. The only way that this universe, I think, works correctly 
is if each show is really different and speaks to a different part of Star Trek. This is going to be a very thoughtful, psychological portrait in a lot of ways, end quote. Very interesting there. And in addition, Picard will be facing, quote, a gauntlet, as Kurtzman puts it. And he reaffirmed that while some things are fundamental to the character, Picard will be facing a journey to rediscover himself. So uh, lots of um, cerebral stuff going on there. The show is scheduled to start filming in just a couple of weeks as we record this episode of Trek Geeks. And although it's not confirmed, it's believed that it's going to be a highly serialized series with 10 episodes it's expected for season one. And that's 10 episodes that I will be watching every single second live. Uh, yes, same here. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing from Kurtzman's quotes, and I felt that it, it makes sense to call this out because I'm really kind of blown away by it. And it reminds me of how we all felt at STLV when, when Patrick took the stage. And that's this quote. I had, an amazing, uh, I had an amazing experience the other morning, Kurtzman said. I sat at Patrick Stewart's kitchen table, heard him read the first episode, and I almost cried, mm. end quote. Mm. Uh, you read that and it's like, wow, it's got to feel like something amazing to, to see this character coming home right to Star Trek right before your very eyes. Um, I, and that's amazing because I didn't know Kurtzman could cry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Wow. No, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's amazing. I can't wait for this show either, buddy. You know, we have so many. I was thinking about this when we were talking about the last news segment, so I'm going to digress a little bit. The last couple of years have been the first time that I have been to conventions where there is an actual Star Trek show going on at the time. Yeah. And it's an incredible thing. So we've got Discovery now. Next year at this time, or next year at STLV, the Picard series will have been in on television, on CBS All Access. Yeah. We're going to have two shows, possibly the animated series. There's so much good stuff. And knowing that Sir Patrick Stewart is involved in this and he is engaged in it, no pun intended, um, I just, I, I'm so excited about this. I can't wait to see it because I don't think we're going to see the Picard that we expect or we have ever seen before. And it's going to be an interesting thing to watch. I don't think we should see the Picard that we expect. I think that's what mm -hmm. will make this interesting. So yeah, uh, moving on. Uh, also in news, Dan, you know, a couple of months ago, we had such a great time talking with William Sadler, who, of course, played Luther Sloan in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, you know, uh, Section 31 operative. I can see him above your head there on the back wall of your your studio. Mm -hmm. um, you've got that photo of him right there, which is awesome. And it looks like fans of Bill Sadler's can look forward to him in a familiar role soon and maybe not the one they think. No, uh, and I actually think this is great. One of the most popular and funny roles uh, that Mr. Sadler has ever done was that of Death in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. And uh, just uh, released uh, very recently, fans will be happy to hear that he will be reprising his role of Death in the upcoming third installment of that franchise, Bill and Ted Face the Music. Now, why there's a third chapter in the Bill and Ted's movie franchise is another question in and of itself, but uh, you sank my battleship. <laughs> for, uh, for those who want to hear the interview, in fact, he talks a little bit about Bill and Ted and, and that, uh, and playing death in that, in that movie. It's episode 160 of the Trek Geeks podcast. Uh, you can hear our interview with William Zadler today if you want. In fact, you don't have to listen to Dan anymore. Just uh, hit stop here and, and mute him and go listen to Bill Zadler because he's awesome. There's awesome. always good things to think about, isn't there? Yeah, especially when it comes to muting you. Exactly. Uh, and finally, Dan, you know, we're really excited about the latest news coming from Eagle Moss. This one's a surprise. We love having them as a sponsor here on Trek Geeks occasionally, and they're about to release a product that really made us both do a double take. It's really kind of cool. I got to be honest, man. You sent me this link only a few hours ago because this news just came out. Um, let me ask you, uh, our listeners a question. Have you ever wanted to build the Enterprise D and have the Enterprise D model that you build look just as beautiful as the one on television with lights and everything? Well, Eagle Moss is going to let you do that because they are releasing this new process where you can build the Enterprise D. You can subscribe to this. Uh, you will get four, quote, issues sent to you every month uh, for $10.90 plus $1.95 shipping and handling. There will be 100 of these, quote, unquote, issues, and these issues will include parts to build the Enterprise D. And when it is all done and built, you will have a model that is over two feet 
long and has lights and a gorgeous display base. You're going to get $80 of, uh, of free gifts when you subscribe. You can upgrade and get a special uh, stand which has LED lights and mirrors in it. This really looks amazing. And I got to tell you, Bill, I was on the website looking at this and it is gorgeous. The videos showing the detail are amazing. And this is one that I'm actually really, really thinking I might have to do. Uh, I totally understand why. I mean, if this were the TMP Enterprise, I'd be right there with you. Yeah. I like the D. It's just, it's not it's not my enterprise. You know what I mean? Uh, if I'm going to shell out that kind of cash, yeah. I want it to be the you know, the ship that, that tugs at my heartstrings. I totally agree. The Enterprise D is not my favorite ship either, but this really looks good. And I'll tell you what, uh, Eagle Moss, uh, if you're listening in, you release a Defiant from Deep Space Nine, I'll buy two. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get to have one? Yeah, I'll get you one because I can't. I would just love to have that. So (laughs) I have recorded evidence. Dan's going to buy me a defiant. Thank you. Dan, moving on to our main topic this week, we're going to consider the women of Star Trek. And this is a topic that you and I have talked about doing for a long time. It's one that we're excited to do because, like we said at the top of the show, there are so many important contributions um, uh, all over Star Trek from all kinds of amazing women. And uh, today we're going to focus in on one particular aspect. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, trying to come up with who to talk about and why we want to talk about those particular characters is is or has been a very daunting challenge because there are so many to choose from. I mean, all of these characters that we've we've grown to love over the years have played such an integral part of each series that they've been in, and they've been real role models for young women all over the world. Um, and you know, not just young women, women of all ages because of their strength and, and, and what they have contributed to the history of Trek and to the genre with their characters. So, uh, it, it was kind of tough to come up with exactly who, but, um, it's really something that I think we'll have a great time talking about. I think this is the kind of topic where if you ask us on any given day, the character or the, uh, the woman who we bring up as, as being the, 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 the impetus behind that character could change. At least I think that's true for me. I mean, today I might pick five or six and a month from now, there might be some differences in that list simply because um, th- there are so many amazing women in Star Trek. I think you're absolutely right. And that goes um, uh, on uh, the positive of that is that is because it's, it, there are so many strong female roles in this universe that depending on your mood, it could be a different person. And that doesn't, da- that doesn't diminish what the other people that you might have chosen previously contributed. It's just because they're so good and there's so many different ones to choose from that made such an impactful uh, role on people. I, I agree with you entirely. It's interesting to see the progression of the female characters in Star Trek, starting from the original series and progressing through the various... Um, uh, sequels and spinoffs, I guess, for one of a different word. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the original series, I mean, you had a series of women who were um, different in the sense what they had roles equal to men. Mm-hmm. You know, they had very important roles. You had a Uhura who was on the bridge. And let's let's just start with Uhura because, I mean, she's she was the first. Uh, she makes the most sense to talk about first. Um, I think about Uhura and I, I think about well, obviously the fact that Uhura was my first crush ever, but that's mm-hmm. that's only because she was just so amazing and was the best at what she did. And, you know, I think back to Mirror Mirror, right? When our four uh, Enterprise crew members are in the Mirror Universe and Uhura has to go to the bridge and, you know, she's got to distract Sulu, you know, mm-hmm. so that the so that nobody notices the flashing on the board. And she doesn't think she can do it. And Kirk says, Uhura, you've got to. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can do it. <laughs> and in that moment, it's like, wow. You know, Captain Kirk, I mean, he's the guy who, like, you know, 
always fights the Klingons and, you know, always, you know, saves the day. And in order to get this done, he needs Uhura to do this thing. And that puts an amazing amount of confidence and respect and credibility into that character. And that's one of the reasons why I love Uhura so much. We know she's the best at what she does. And there are moments like that where you get to see that that's exactly who the character is. Yeah, the other thing, the strength of the character is something that always stuck out to me in that very episode. She's, she is frightened. She admits that she's frightened. Kirk tells her she's the only one who can do it. But when she gets on that bridge, she is strong and she takes care of Sulu, whether it's, you know, you know, snark- snarkily telling him that uh, he's away from his post or, or pulling the dagger on him and then just giving him that look when she's putting it back in the sheath on her leg. Very, very strong uh, uh, female lead, not just a role. She's the lead, the female yeah. lead in that series. And I think it really, it really was amazing. I want to go back a little bit further though, Bill, I want to yeah. talk about number one for just a second. Oh yeah. Of course in the cage and in the menagerie, we get to see, Majel playing number one. And a lot of people over the years have really had a problem with the way that she is treated um, in the episode. But I think her level of strength and intelligence and beauty as that character, I mean, Pike even tells her that he can't go on the away mission because they need someone like her to stay on the ship in case there's a problem. I mean, people have taken that as, oh, they just don't want the women to go on the away missions. I take it the exact opposite. They need somebody that if something happens, the smartest and brightest and best person is going to still be in charge on the Enterprise. And that, of course, is the first officer played by Mary Jo. I've always loved that character, even though we only get to see her in that one slash two episodes. No, I, I agree with you entirely. And this is a good point, you know, time to check point and say, look, we understand that there's rampant sexism mm-hmm. through the original series. You know, we understand what the 60s were. We're not excusing any of that. Instead, we're looking at the aspects of these characters to celebrate. Yes, there were times in the dialogue um, where we cringe. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times in the dialogue where perhaps these characters weren't treated as well as they might be today. But we want to talk about what makes these characters so strong and so amazing and and so worthy of uh, of call outs and recognition because Star Trek wouldn't be the same without them. I think that's a fair statement. I think it's a very fair statement. Uh, we 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 see that that talk all the time nowadays, and I always go back and say, you know what? Unfortunately, that's the way it was back then. And for a, no better word, people were ignorant back then of how people should be treated. It's part of the history. I don't say we we just try to hide it and forget about it. We use it to educate uh, the younger generations as to the mistakes that were made in the past and move on, but still be able to show just how strong these uh, these female characters were uh, back then in the original series because they were all great, whether it's Uhura or Number One or Chapel or any of the guest stars that we saw. They're all brilliant. Well, you know, and going back to the cage for a minute, and and by virtue of that, the menagerie, I want to take a, talk a little bit about Yeoman Colt. Um, because I mean, that's a character who's a little wide eyed. It's a character who's new to, to space. Obviously she's in a much lower rank. Um, she does have that yeoman, uh, rank that, that, that ran sort of fills later, you know, where she sort of does things, you know, and for the captain. Sure. But if she shows a tremendous amount of courage in that episode. Yeah. Um, to the point where I think it's, I wish it's a character that we had gotten to know more because I think that there was so much potential there. Um, and the way Laurel Goodwin portrayed the character. I, I, I love the character of Yeoman Colt. It's one of the reasons why I love the episode of The Cage. You mentioned Majel also as number one. I see why they were the two that were essentially beamed down at Talos IV by the Talosians, because while still very different, they are both very strong and offset Christopher Pike exceedingly well. Absolutely, and we can't forget about uh, Susan Oliver either. Right. As Vina, I mean... Just that first episode, the very first pilot, the 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 strength of the female characters in just that that one forty five minute uh, pilot shows you, I think, what Gene wanted to portray um, as what the future can hold, the the equality and 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 being able to allow these characters to to really evolve into what we are happy that they evolved into. 
Uh, agreed. Uh, and I, I, I like to examine the cage in this regard because I think it, it's very important in looking at TOS the way we do and, and the, 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 the women who were part of that crew. You know, there is Uhura, there's, there's uh, Chapel, uh, there's Rand. You know, and, and if I think of Chapel, uh, I see a lot of the same qualities in number one, obviously, because of Majel's performance. But I think Chapel is a, f- a really interesting character. I don't think that she gets the due that, that, that she deserves um, simply because she is relegated to a secondary status in many scenes um, against DeForest Kelly. But if I look at what little girls are made of and I look at how they kind of took Chapel and made her a central focus of that episode, along with the, uh, the relationship with Roger Corby, um, I, there's, I, there's a lot there that I, I wish that they had continued to do for Christine Chapel. One of my favorite episodes of the original series is What Are Little Girls Made Of? I just love her performance in that. I do like how in the motion picture, she was uh, an, an MD at that point. Mm-hmm. She had she had become a doctor. Um, it seems, it, it, it's funny, isn't it, that um, every character that Majel played is one of the major female characters that we're going to talk about. <laughs> and, and I'm even talking as, as something like the computer voice. Yeah. Because that is something that has been in just about every iteration of Star Trek um, that we have ever seen. And it's, it's Majel and Majel is immortal because of that. So she's always done a fantastic job, but yeah, the way that they handled um, chapel in what are little girls made of made me long for more chapel stories. And we, we really never got anything else other than her, like you said, just being a secondary figure in sick or something like that, or being the one that loves Spock and was never going to be able to have him. Yeah. And that, that's an aspect of, of Chapel's character that I appreciate, but I think that uh, there were times where that became too much the focus of Chapel because she is so much more than that. You know, she kind of fawns over Spock in the beginning of a muck time, bringing him soup. And then Spock freaks out and throws the soup against the wall. And, you know, uh, it's just it, a lot of that seems very stereotypical um, to, to the 1960s and the portrayal of the dynamics between men and women to me. But um, I, I have to say, I'm a huge Christine Chapel fan and I always have been. Um, that's, I think, largely because, like you said, I'm just such a huge Majel fan. Um, and you, you brought up the computer. I think that's an interesting point because I hadn't considered that character. Mm-hmm. But truly, it is a character. I mean, they made the conscious decision to make it a woman's voice right. as opposed to a man's voice. And I, I think that's kind of brilliant in hindsight because I think it adds some much needed diversity to the voices you hear. I mean, much of the action in Star Trek is carried forth by men, whether it's Kirk or Spock or McCoy or Scotty or Sulu or Chekhov. And when they talk to the computer, it's an authoritative voice, mm-hmm. a voice that pretty much tells them what's going on. It's the voice of reason. It's the voice of science. And although it sounds a little fifties robotic, um, it, it, it plays a very central element to the show. And I'm really glad you brought that up. I look at the computer voice in the original series as the maternal part of the show. Um, I've always kind of had that and, and you could see the difference in what that, feeling was when they had the um, stop at a, a star base and they had a change to the computer voice. Hmm. And it was more of that sultry stereotypical female voice from back in the sixties. And it just didn't work. Of course, they worked that into the story to be that way. But yeah, I, I love the fact that, um, that uh, Majel's computer voice carried along all through TNG part of deep space nine. I just, I thought that was a great uh, tribute to Majel as well. That's tomorrow is yesterday, right? Yes, with uh, Colonel Sean Jeffrey Christopher. Yes, nice job. I can't believe I pulled that one out. That's, I can't believe that either. <laughs> uh, that would, uh, I guess that's never going to be in Geek the Stump. I'm screwed now. <laughs> um, it's a, it, I appreciate the original series for what it is, despite its obvious flaws. Because it taught me at a very young age that you know women were just as important in the role of, in this case, a starship, or in a quasi-military organization, or in really any kind of organization as men were. And that wasn't something you always saw on television. I think back to some of the shows I grew up with in the 70s, you know, some of the cop shows, some of the detective shows, some of the other comedies, and it's still very sexist. I can think of episodes of Starsky and Hutch, you know, where, you know, women are getting, you know, slapped on the behind in the workplace. And it, 
it strikes me then, you know, that we're coming now almost 10 years after Star Trek premiered and that's still going on on television. And I like to think that Star Trek in that sense was a little subversive as far as culture went mm-hmm. because it did treat, you know, those, those important female characters as critical to the organization and they should be respected in every way. Yeah, the only time you saw something like that was Charlie X doing it to uh, yeah. to, to Rand in one of the right. early episodes. One of the things that I like about the original series and the strength of the female characters that we've seen is they don't always have to be the good guys to be a really strong character. Look at uh, Janice Lester. Now, Janice had some issues, obviously, but she was a strong, quote-unquote, villain for that final episode of TOS, regardless of whether you like the episode or agree with what they were talking about mm. with female captains, this, that, and the other thing. But look at Dila or look at Alan of Troyes. I mean, that's a very strong character um, that we saw back in the original series, played by a female, held his, held their own with with Kirk and Spock and, and so forth. And I think that's another um, positive thing that we saw uh, way back then when that wasn't the norm. Or uh, a real Shaw in um, a court martial. Right. You know, she plays the attorney that has to prosecute Kirk. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, that that's a, that's a pretty heavy load. You know, he's, he's the, the captain of, of one of the, you know, the 12 vessels out there exploring the galaxy and she's got to potentially bring him to justice. And that's, that's a daunting task. Uh, so um, I can appreciate that one too, just as a guest star. Right. And of course, you know, the one that I think everybody in terms of guest stars talk to is the strength of the character and and how it actually this character shapes the entire future for for Kirk going forward is Joan Collins as as Eve Keeler in City on the Edge of Forever. I mean, just just the definition of a strong female lead uh, back then with that performance. I mean, we've talked about whether whether or not it's our favorite episode of Star Trek ever, ever or not, but it doesn't diminish that portrayal was no it it absolutely doesn't i mean i i think with any other person playing edith keeler i don't think that the gravity of what that character means to kirk and to star trek overall is maybe as as evident i mean joan collins is is the consummate pro she's a fantastic thespian um she she's amazing i mean that's why i mean she was so successful in dynasty playing you know uh uh, playing the evil character because she was great at at that particular right. role, but mm-hmm. she's literally great in everything she's in. Um, so the only other person I think that could maybe possibly have played either Keeler was Elizabeth Taylor, but that's just me talk, talking off the top. Uh, that's pie in the sky. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, moving forward a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about some next gen characters. And I'm going to start with one that you may not think um, that I might, and that's probably Tasha Yar. Um, I think Tasha Yar is very mold-breaking in many ways. Um, in the original series, it seemed like the women there were mostly uh, had caregiving roles to some extent. Yeoman Rand was responsible for taking care of Captain Kirk, and Nurse Chapel was responsible for taking care of patients. And some people say that Uhura essentially answered the phone um, which I understand the criticism, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. But you know, you come forward to the next generation and Tasha Yar, a character who I think was just horribly underused and not written very well throughout the first season or next gen. And there is there the the basis of an incredibly strong character and one that is very different than anything we've seen before in Star Trek at that point. We really have to think of what TNG would have been like if there had not been the issues between Denise and and the and the show, and she stayed on. Of course, we saw her come back um, in yesterday's Enterprise, which I know you love, and and all good things. And of course, she came back as a Romulan later on, but it just was never the same. Um, it, it was. It's funny. I I I kind of remember sitting up and kind of looking at the TV different when she challenged Picard and she was yelling at him pretty much talking about how when she was raised on whatever planet it was with the rape games and everything you didn't see that before in Star Trek where a character was so confident in, her, in herself that she would raise her voice to her commanding officer kind of first time we saw that and I was like whoa who's this person uh Turkana four I believe it was uh, wow that's two tonight man I know I know it's I should play the lottery. This is amazing. I've never done this before. Um, 
And that's the episode where Riker's given the power of the cue and she's put in the penalty box, right? I, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, she shows such amazing, um, not really fragility, but s- some real um, vulnerability there um, in front of Picard. You know, part of that lashing out at him is because she is scared. And that's a character that's not used to being scared. Right. I mean, she's the security chief of the Enterprise D. She's the one who's supposed to lead the way. She's the one who's supposed to neutralize the threat. And she's in a role where she can't do that because this all-powerful, all-knowing being just isn't going to make that possible. Mm -hmm. And I I agree with you. I think it's probably one of Denise's best outings as Tasha Yar. Um, But overall, I think that having that strength right there on the bridge, and I mean, directly behind Picard on the horseshoe, I think was important to setting the tone for Next Generation. In addition to having a, you know, a counselor on the bridge like Troy, I think that having a chief of security that was as prominent right behind the card sent a clear message to the viewer. Well, look at what you're talking about the horseshoe on the bridge. You have Tasha behind him. You have Deanna next to him. And a lot of times on that little tiny seat, which I don't know how it could have been comfortable, you would have Dr. Crusher sitting there as well. So you have these three powerful women on the bridge with the captain, with Riker, helping make these decisions that could ultimately decide whether or not the crew lives or dies. I think it's great. Well, and the other thing too, is just you know, the way next gen was constructed. I mean, you know, Picard as a leader considers everybody's input because it's all valid. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a fantastic leader. He's a great manager of people, if you will. And it doesn't matter what role they serve on the ship. Their input is equally as important as uh, the kid who drives the starship. You know, <laughs> what's, what's his name again? Um, Wentel, uh, weirdly, or something like that. Shut up, Wesley. Or Ron Weasley. That's what it was. Ron Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Tashi R is is key into understanding how the role of women evolved from TOS to TNG, and then you get to a character like Deanna Troy, that is completely the polar opposite of what Tashi R is about, mm-hmm. but not any less important. And I think that's fascinating. The, the, you said the polar opposites of these two and how they present themselves at any given time. Uh, She has, she, she is kind of, we talked about the computer voice being kind of kind of like the maternal aspect of TOS. Deanna, I've felt that that's what her job is. She's the one who is to be able to set things, calm things down get things to a point where everybody can, you know, rationally discuss something. And it's a role that is going to be extremely difficult when you have so many people on board the ship and so many different emotions that she can sense all at once. And, and whether or not there's music playing in the back of her head or not at the whole time, but, (laughs) but it really is another brilliant example of casting, casting, not only just Marina, but casting a female for a role like that. It really shows how, the thought process over time has evolved in making these strong characters. So here, Bill, here we are, as we normally would at this point, we've got some big news from our friends at fan sets. And as a matter of fact, it is so big that just you and I cannot do it by ourselves. So with that being said, I am very happy I'm very honored and very proud to bring here to this very podcast of Trek Geeks, the one and only Lou Halbeth from Fansets. Lou, welcome back to Trek Geeks, man, because we got some big Fansets news to talk about tonight. This is home sweet home, the the mothership. Thank you for having me on. And uh, boy, we got some really great stuff to talk about here. We really do. It's um, we look forward every year to the big set you guys do um, and draw and release it at Star Trek Las Vegas every year, and um, it, it's really become a you know a talking point for you know all of fandom and it's for Star Trek. People look forward to this release every year. Dan and I get excited about it every year. I mean, um, you know, I can see Dan's hanging on his wall right behind his head right there. Um, <laughs> You know, it's it, it, your your product now is becoming the stuff of legend at convention time. And this week, you guys are are cluing us in to what this year's special set is going to be, and it's exciting. Well, we're excited to to use uh, our you guys as our our medium to get to the fans. Uh, 
Trek Geeks is is our is our podcast, and John and I every week it's a uh, it's our journey to babble to listen to you guys uh, babble, uh, <laughs> and, and we we really enjoy it. And and you guys represent such a positive spin of of what Star Trek can be to, to the fandom. Uh, I think that I think that's what drew us to you, and uh, we're really excited about this set. This set's going to be. Uh, different than anything we've done to this point so far with the big sets we've launched we call them the master sets and the master sets you know we did the captain set the first year which was the 50th anniversary we followed that up with the next generation set and then last year we did deep space nine that the, as they hit their anniversary marks and this year there's there's really not a big star trek anniversary per se so what we're going to launch this year at STLB, and this is going to be an ongoing series, it's not just a one and done, is that we're, we're very excited and proud to announce that we are launching the Women of Trek collection. The initial set will be a nine pin set that will retail at the show for $175. That will include the backer and the frame and the nine pins. Uh, and tonight we're going to we're, we're going to talk about the nine characters that we're going to bring out, and we're going to have a show special pin that will be available at the show uh, that'll be oversized. Now these the first nine pins are going to be approximately the size of our ship pins. They will include our signature glitter that we put on all of our show specials that we do, uh, and the oversized pin that we're going to do will be a unique design produced in limited quantities and this pin will be between two and a half and three inches mm. so there you go we're very excited and we can we can start talking about who's in the first who the first characters are i just want to say that just the fact that there's going to be glitter on these pins i love glitter bill i think you love glitter so lay it on us man because we've seen okay. some preliminary information of what uh what this is going to be like and i gotta tell you i'm I'm probably more excited about this one than I have been in other ones because they are going to be phenomenal. So what do we got for these first nine pins? Excellent. Well, as you, as you guys know, th this is a, a series that, uh, a franchise that has had so many strong female characters in, in science fiction and, and what they bring to the fans that they can take to their real lives that there's just no way we could do nine pins and be done with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why this will be an ongoing series. We took one character from uh, each of the shows and then we're, we're sprinkling in uh, a couple other strong characters that uh, will go along with it. And then as, as we go forward, we'll bring in uh, through you guys, through some other outlets, where the fans can actually vote who the next characters are going to be. So without further ado, um, our, our first nine characters are going to be uh, Gates McFadden as Crusher, uh, Lieutenant Uhura, Major Kira, uh, Captain Janeway, uh, Jolene Blairox Tapal, uh, Michael Burnham, Deanna Troy, and then the two that I'm really kind of that that are the kind of our fringe characters we're bringing, but they were strong female leads: Edith Keeler and Alice Craig Borg Queen. Wow, so, nice! That so is yeah, fantastic. a real good mix of characters. Uh, unlike any of the all the other pins we've done for the master sets over the years, where they kind of went together to form something, each of these pins will be independent. of unto themselves so uh the the edith keeler pin will probably have uh you know something from that episode uh in the background I don't, you, you can probably guess what it's going to be uh, <laughs> a car <laughs> couple guys, couple guys jump through it uh, <laughs> so every pin will have a individual design okay that is uh signifies their their character 
much like we always do where we have the name and rank in, in the ma- other master sets, mm-hmm. uh, it'll, it'll, we'll have the actress's name on it. We'll have, you know, the series, we'll have their character name, and it'll be uh, specifically designed for their characters. And, and when people put these on the board, they'll be able to put them on the board in any fashion. The, the initial set will be done with the, the, the nine pins, but as we release other female characters ongoing, and, and we'll also have the boards uh, in, individually available for sale, You'll be able to board, You'll be able to keep building the women of Trek boards as we go along, and that's just really exciting. As as we're seeing with Discovery, with so many more strong female leads coming in, uh, and characters, and you know the new Picard movie, our show. It's it's going to be just an exciting collection for people to get their hands on. For STLB, we're going to do a special edition Uhura pin. Uh, since this will this will be her last STLV, it'll, we're, we're kind of doing it as a commemorative pin for her final appearance. It'll be an oversized pin. They will be produced in limited quantities for the show, and it'll be between two and a half and three inches. Wow, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, looking at the list of of characters you've selected for this initial run of nine. Um, uh, th- th- this is an amazing list of just such strong women in Star Trek, but I mean, all of the women in Star Trek are amazing and strong. How tough was it to pair the list down to this initial nine? And were there any you wanted to include in the first set that, that you just didn't have the room for? Well, that's, that's, that, that, therein lies the hardest question producing something like this. The, the other sets we, we knew, who the characters were, it was very easy to figure out what, who was going where and who we were going to do. This, this is such a, you know, it's, it's a universe of characters that we can do here. So that's kind of the guideline we looked at for the picking a single female character from the episodes. Uh, we know we missed, you know, we, we don't have Chapel in there. You know, we, we don't right. have, uh, Bellana. There's so many other, but those characters will come, and that's the beauty of this collection is that uh, you'll, you, you know, if the fans vote for it, you know, and that's what we're going to be doing through you. We're going to have uh, several of the characters that we bring out every year will be done will be chosen by the fans through contests, either through Trek Geeks or Trek Core. Uh, we're going to do something where people will go online and vote for the, the, the favorite character. And then we're, we're going to let the people's vote count. And that's, that's who we'll produce for, for that year's set. And, and there's a little bit that goes on um, where we, we have to take into some consideration because decisions are made internally or in cooperation with CBS. We may bring out a character who is premiering, in the Picard series as one of the characters and there's you know so that some some of that is kind of fluid at this 10 seconds but I can tell you this much the fans will get to decide on half of the characters probably of what's coming out so it takes it out of our hands and we're not playing favorites it'll be by 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 the by the fans vote that's fantastic. So, so what we're going to be doing over the course of, I guess you could say that this is going to be a year long celebration, Lou, with the women of Trek, with this, uh, with this uh, set from fan set. So we've talked and what we're going to do is people are going to want to keep an eye on Camp Kittimer and the Trek Geek site because we'll actually have polls out there and we'll ask people to vote for what character they would like to see in a particular pin and the ones that come in the top. They're going to be made, just like you said. We're going to let the fans talk and bring out these these uh, female characters that they love the most, and they're going to be able to add them to the wall, just like with all the other great great pins and collections that you guys have come out with. Absolutely, and you know, for for instance, next year's twenty fifth when we're at STLV, the uh, the special oversized pin will be a, probably be a Janeway pin, mm-hmm. just because it's it will coincide with you know the the, the Voyager celebration for twenty five. Uh, we will premiere all of these images 
through Trek Geeks. I don't, I don't know if you guys knew that. I don't know if we talked about that, but John and I <laughs> talked about it. We know now. <laughs> yep, you guys are going to be, you guys are going to get your hands on it first. The, the folks at Camp Kittimer are going to get to see them before anybody else. And we're going to start seeing images here very soon. Uh, as soon as we can get them close enough for licensing to, to let us bring some, some stuff out. So we're getting really close to them. That's just, that's amazing. I mean, you know, it's one thing when you consider the amount of work you guys put into these sets and just the top notch quality that fan sets is just known for throughout fandom. And then, you know, you're looking at a, an array of characters and then a fan vote and then special, uh, you know, uh, show exclusive ones for her this year and probably Janeway next year. This is just going to be a massive set. And like Dan, I'm excited for this one. I mean, uh, Dan loves glitter. I love glitter. I'm just covered in glitter right now, you know, honestly. And I can't wait for a day where Dan can vote for the Keiko O'Brien pin he's always wanted. <laughs> I, I thought Dan was going to Moogie. <laughs> I actually like the idea of the Keiko pin because nobody will expect that. So, so there we go. My vote is in. <laughs> well, it's so it is tabulated. That is fantastic. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, to breaking more of this, uh, more details on this set with you guys as we go forward. Uh, we're you know as as we talk now, as I check my handy dandy phone, STLV is a mere 127 days away as we record this. I imagine you guys are working feverishly to prepare as you always do. Yeah, 24 <laughs> seven. Who needs sleep, right, Lou? Ah, yeah, is uh, John needs to <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, um, but, you know, I, I just want we just want to say yeah. I want to say thank you to all the fans who support us. We're a small company. Everybody's important. Everybody gets re we reply and respond to everybody, and we appreciate your friendship, your patronage, and your criticism. So uh, as well. So and and thank you to you guys. We could not be with two greater people who love uh, Star Trek as much as we do. And uh, you guys are the best. Absolutely the best. Well, it's right back at you, buddy. And it's because of you that we can tell Trek Geeks listeners that, uh, you know, just because we're talking to Lou doesn't mean there's not a special fan sets discount offer code this week. There absolutely is. Um, if you go to fan sets now, in fact, start stocking up because when you get to STLV, you're going to want lots of room in your bag to carry home these beautiful you know, women of Star Trek pins. So go to fansets.com, put a whole bunch of pins, a ton of pin accessories in your cart. And when you click that checkout button, type in the checkout code MOM, that's M O M, all together, all capitals, no spaces at checkout for 15% off your entire order. That's right. Lou has given us 15% off, and it's exciting, isn't it, Dan? Don't you think it's kind of ironic that the code word for this week is MOM, and we're talking about the women of Trek? uh special uh collection at stlv that's kind of that's kind of funny that it fell into place like that <laughs> i think so too this code is good to use until uh sunday march 31st 2019 11 59 p.m eastern daylight time i just quoted that off the top of my head isn't that beautiful that was pretty good it was good because we don't have it in the copy this week. And you did it like you've been doing it all along uh uh spuck uh lou uh, we we love you. We love John. We love everybody with fan sets. You guys are, are our dear friends, and we couldn't be more proud to have you as part of Trek Geeks uh, each and every week. Um, uh, certainly, we need to have you back more often, and we're so glad you could uh, join us briefly tonight to talk about this amazing set. It is our pleasure, and as you know, we are Star Trek. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Speaking of thought processes over time, I'm actually going to admit to a change of heart with a particular character that in the past I have not enjoyed at all. And it's taken 30 plus years, <laughs> Okay, but I think I've developed the right appreciation. And that character is Dr. Pulaski. Um, I've been down on Pulaski before because I just thought she was a cheap clone of bones. And in rewatching season two of next gen, I appreciate what they really try to do with the character. I love Diana Muldaur every time she's in Star Trek. And I, I think that 
it was an interesting contrast to Beverly Crusher in season one um, and Beverly Crusher when she came back in seasons three through seven. Uh, I think Pulaski was a great foil for Picard. I think that Pulaski was an incredible voice of reason. I think Pulaski was an amazing doctor. Um, and I have got to say, I'm finally in the eye kind of like Pulaski Club. I, I have to say it. I think that as far as strong women go, um, I have to put Pulaski in that category. That's very interesting to me. I have not come around like you have yet. But then again, I haven't watched a lot of season two recently. I've always thought that Pulaski was put in there just to be a pain in the ass, to be perfectly honest with mm. you and to be blunt. Um, could use another word, but I'm not going to use it because we're talking about the strength of the women characters in Star Trek. But, you know, you said that she was the voice of reason. I say that based on what I remember is that she was always there just to play devil's advocate. No matter what the issue was, she was going to come up with a different reason just so she could do it. Instead of calling him data, she wanted to call him data. I mean, just those little things that really got under my skin at the time. But as you have, I have to go back and rewatch it and see if I can have a different vision or view on how that character is. And I got to say, I'm, I'm very open to doing that because we've talked about things that I haven't liked in the past or episodes like up the long ladder or, or, um, or move along home, move along home. And I've come to have a, a better appreciation for those episodes after that right now, though, not really there. And that's surprising to me because like you, I loved her contributions to TOS. Well, and Pulaski's a character that definitely evolves over the time she's on the ship. Yes, yeah, she is absolutely brusque when she starts on the show. She's constantly interrupting Picard. Like you said, she's the devil's advocate. But as that season goes on, she becomes a, you know, a key member of the team. She and Picard have less headbutting, and they cooperate far more. Um, and I think he relies on her judgment by the end of the season. It's unfortunate that the season ends with Shades of Grey, which yeah. I have to say is actually a very strong Pulaski contribution in that episode. True. But as far as women of Star Trek, I feel like I can't pass up that opportunity to talk about Pulaski because um, they didn't, when Gates McFadden left the show after season one because of her rift with uh, with the producers, Um, they could have cast anybody in that role. Mm -hmm. They could have cast a man. They could have cast uh, a hologram. Sure. They saved for Voyager. Uh, They could have done anything. And instead they cast uh, an amazing actress with, you know, a a resume that's longer than your arm. Who's worked with Gene before and who brought a quality to that performance that was different than anything she's ever played in Star Trek. And so I have to respect that on a variety of levels. And isn't it amazing that we can go back and re look at these characters and appreciate what they've contributed when before we didn't or didn't want to, I think that's another testament to how they uh, have uh, done such a great job uh, with these female characters on the show. So I will go back and I will watch season two at some point and look at it with, uh, with a new, uh, new look at it see if I appreciate it more. Shades of gray, still not the worst episode. No, it's oh God, not by, not by long shot. No. Aquiel looking at you. (laughs) <laughs> dude uh what other um what other characters would you like to uh call out i, I feel like i filibustered a little bit but um went to which which women would you like to highlight as far as being integral to star trek i think without a doubt um i have to talk about kira on deep space nine mm. um we i've talked about how i did not care for the character in the first yeah. season i thought she was a pain in the butt i thought all she did was complain and look like she was about to lose her temper or start crying or or not but then when you really stop and think about what this person has gone through during the occupation now she's second in command of a station of a space station that was once run by the people that were her oppressors when she was younger shows the strength and how that relationship with her and and Ben and the rest of the crew grows over time. Nana is absolutely phenomenal in this role. Nobody could have could have even come close to playing this character as she did. And we when we talked with Nana uh, way back 4 years ago and we we talked about how that character would not be possible in today's world after 9/11 and how she had to put herself in the mindset of what a terrorist 
thinks while she was on the show is just something that blows my mind. And I, I just, I just, I don't think I can ever stop appreciating what that character was like for that show. Well, you know, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. And it's interesting because we, uh, we talked in and on episode 10 of the Trek Geeks podcast. I know that because I just looked it up. Um, it was four years ago. It seems like it was forever. Um, but it was probably one of our earliest and best conversations uh, of all time. I remember asking Nana if she had considered the fact that really Dax and Kira together were sort of game changing for Star Trek. You know, Kira is a, is a freedom fighter. Kira is somebody that's helped liberate her people. And Dax is a true scientist who has lived seven lifetimes. Mm -hmm. um, these are characters with ama that come into the show already with amazing depth of character. And that's really something at that point that we hadn't seen very much of. Yes, the women of Next Gen had developed characters, but I feel like for Deep Space Nine, it was elevated even more, which is one of the reasons I love Kira so much. Kira is fierce. Kira is loyal. Kira will do anything that she is asked to do for the people of Bajor or ultimately to support Star, uh, Starfleet and Cisco. And I think that those qualities are probably why Kira is one of my favorite characters in the whole of Star Trek. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I also have to give um, huge thumbs up to, to Terry and what she did with the character of Dax. I'm a, I'm a Terry Dax fan more than I am uh, a Nicole Dax fan, but I love both of them. But I got to say, watching Deep Space Nine during its first run, and I'm not trying to diminish or belittle or anything, I had the biggest crush on on Terry as Dax back when the show was first on in the 90s. Such a beautiful actress. Her character was wonderful. And she brought that, that flirtality to Deep Space Nine that I really thought worked with her character that might not have worked with others. But then, on top of all that, I really learned what a strong character she was with all of those lifetimes of knowledge and the character of Jadzia herself, not just Dax was very strong. Also, I love the dynamic that she had with her and, and Avery as, as Cisco that Kira and Dax may be the, the best female duo in Star Trek history. I think they're just so great. I can't challenge that one bit. Uh, I agree with you. I, I think that one of the things that, that I appreciate the most about Dax is the wisdom. It's like we talked about the seven lifetimes, but I mean, it's one thing to have all that information in your brain. It's another thing to be able to take it and mold it into advice to give to other people and to use it and to use it judiciously. And that's something that the Dax character does exceedingly well. You know, it's got to be a daunting task for a 28 year old woman, which is how old Dax is when she reaches deep space nine mm -hmm. to have all those lifetimes in her head right? and to have all these memories, to have all these experiences. And I'm sure some of them compete with one another. I'm sure some of the wisdom is um, conflicts at times, yes. but to be able to use it the way she does to counsel Cisco and everybody else on board the station, I think really is what sets Jadzia apart um, from so many other female characters. She has this, she has this ability to see the world for what it is uh, and to see people for who they are. And that's, I think two of Dax's strongest qualities. One of the things, this is kind of silly, but one of the things I love most about Dax is her nickname. Cisco <laughs> calls her old man. I just have always thought that that was the, the best thing about that relationship with the two of them. And they were both cool with it. They were both fine with it. You know, it's like the first time he says it to her, he has this huge smile on his face because that's what he used to call Curzon. But it it really is it really is an amazingly strong character that we see grow with the time that we have her on the station. And it's, and it's unfortunate the way things went, so that she was she wasn't there for the for the rest of the series. But it, it's. Any any Dax episode, chances are I'm gonna sit and just watch the whole thing because it's yeah. just it's just so it's well written, it's well acted, it's a strong female um, lead, and just more kudos to to the character development on on that show. Well, you know, it's funny because I think Old Man was originally intended to be ironic mm. um, because she's not 
an yeah. old man, mm -hmm. but I think it perfectly typifies the role she plays right. uh, to Benjamin Sisko mm -hmm. um, with that wisdom. Exactly. And I, I think Terry turns in a performance that is great across all six seasons, six seasons that she's in. God, say that 10 times fast. <laughs> No, no, really. No, uh, I'm kidding. Six seasons, six seasons, six seasons, six seasons. So I'm going to surprise you about something else now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say I've, I've, I surprised you before Pulaski. That was a big turnabout for me. I've got another one. Okay. Um, I'm going to say that I've become a fan of Catherine Janeway. I, I've always been a fan of Catherine Janeway. We we joke a lot about Voyager and and we always have our little digs, but I think that's that's not to to um, diminish the characters and the growth of these characters and what the what the show is like. We've always you know put little digs in because the writers would write a great story and then they'd have right. to wrap it up in five minutes and the ending usually sucked. But that's only for a few seasons. Um, it's not for all of them. There's some amazing stories, but I'll tell you what, uh, Kate is is the badassest of captains when you really yeah. think about it you put up her you put her up against picard or 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 archer oh, oh, come on no I mean, contest it's no contest at all and and yeah i i've always been a fan uh, of of janeway to be honest with you Janeway is under such incredible pressure and stress those first few seasons of voyager mm -hmm. because you know she's made a decision that has stranded two crews on the other side of of the galaxy right you know and and that weighs on her and you don't really it see does. in every episode how it weighs on her but there are times where i have to give the writers credit here it's like you said we we dump on the writers a lot for voyager but there are times where you see how it takes its toll on janeway and yet she still has to keep going forward yeah because if they don't go forward they don't get home and if they don't get home it's because she didn't get them there and I think that that's, that's key to understanding everything about Janeway. Once I got that, you know, as I'm going through and actually trying to complete Voyager for the very first time, I'm just past the halfway point of season four now. And I get why Janeway is some people's captain. I really do now yeah. because I think she's a tremendous leader. I think that Kate Mulgrew and Catherine Janeway set an amazing example and provide such a wonderful role model for girls and women of all ages. I, I don't want to say I'm crushing on Janeway because that's the wrong message, but my amount of respect for Catherine Janeway is light years beyond what I ever thought it would be. Um, I get why people love Janeway now. For years, my wife and my two kids have said without change, that Voyager is their favorite Star Trek series. Hmm. And I think the one of the main reasons for that is because of what Kate Mulgrew brings to that role. She's she's she feels guilt for what happens. She has to act like the the again, we're back to the the mother aspect of it. She has yep. to act like the mother for the two crews, but at the same time, she still has to be captain. So in in addition to the guilt of stranding them out there and the determination to get them home, she has to be the one to to battle those instincts of, of helping and, and comfort and, and, and being a, a maternal figure, which also can include discipline or, or education. But at the same time, she's their superior officer and she has to act like the captain when she might not always want to. And well, she does a great job of that. And there are times where she doesn't want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So admittedly, I don't remember all of the Voyager episode titles the way I remember other shows because uh, again, I'm still working my way through Voyager so I can be finally be a completionist. But there's the episode where Janeway essentially shuts herself off from the rest of the crew for weeks, if not months. And she essentially does everything through Chakotay and the crew has no idea what she's up to. And it's because of the intense pressure and guilt she feels mm -hmm. for where they're at. And there's never been a captain that's been put in that position before in Star Trek. You know, certainly not Kirk. Um, Kirk would never admit something like that. Picard would, um, but he's just never been in that role. Cisco, I, I don't think he would be that introspective. But Janeway shoulders an intense burden. And the way she chooses to deal with it is very uncaptain-like. 
Um, and, and you see exactly what it does to her. And I, it's a fascinating examination of that character. It's a wonderful performance by Kate Mulgrew. Mm-hmm. And I think it's great development for the character because she has to get out of that funk at some point. Right. Um, in, in addition to everything you're saying about Janeway, one thing that, that I think is very important to also bring up is Jerry Ryan and Seven of Nine. Hmm. There will always be the people out there that say that Jerry was brought in simply to be eye candy for the young teenage guys watching Voyager. But I'll tell you what, Seven of Nine as a character is very strong, is very determined, and I think could be a role model for anybody as to determination and drive and wanting to do what's right. She becomes a role model for um, Naomi Wildman on the show itself. Uh, And I think that the addition of her to a character was an incredibly um, good one for the show. I think that towards the end, her character was not given the respect and um, um, stories that could have had her character grow even more. We've talked about how it turned into the seven and doctor opera show uh, at, at a bunch of times towards the end of the run. But I think that that was a, a brilliant cast um, for a character and her and Janeway are two of the strongest people that have ever been on the Star Trek series. Um, just so I, I redeem myself a little bit. The episode is night. Um, the first one where captain proton is also introduced. Um, oh, okay. That's the one where she sort of locks herself away from the rest of the crew. But okay. I have to agree with you with seven. I'm, I'm warming to seven. Mm-hmm. You know, part of the problem I ran into with Voyagers, I would always abandon it at the same place when it became the Doctor and Seven show. Right. But that had more to do with the stories than it did with Seven mm-hmm. as a character. Yep. I have to agree with you. I mean, uh, Jerry Ryan is really, I don't think she gets the credit she deserves as Seven because like you said, the whole eye candy factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is some great structure around Seven and some really wonderful performances by Jerry Ryan. Uh, it's a character that I am warming to, but absolutely important in the scope of Star Trek. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, there are so many. I mean, we could sit here for four hours talking about only half of the people, uh, women that have made strong roles uh, in Star Trek. But, you know, gosh, just just talking about the ones that we've talked about so far, they all, I mean, I said a few minutes ago, I don't think there's a stronger pair than Dax and Kira. And here I am talking about how strong Janeway and Seven of our, Seven are. And that goes to show how cemented in Star Trek lore these women are and always will be. There's nothing that's going to change that. And I think that's one of the, the best things about what we're talking about now. Here, here. I think this is why this is going to have to be an ongoing series from time <laughs> to time, because we barely put a dent in the list of just characters. Yeah. Um, and there's so much more to talk about. Um, uh, by no means is this a definitive list. By no means is this the last time we'll talk about some of these characters. Um, uh, perhaps people listening have characters uh, they would call out themselves. Please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook or wherever and tell us which characters mean the most to you in the women of Star Trek. I think that would be a really great follow-up for the next time we do this. Yeah, I agree. I'm actually looking forward to sort of like what uh, we talked about with Lou Halbeth uh, with fan sets uh, earlier in the show. Um, maybe this can be a year long celebration on Trek Geeks with the women of Star Trek and have several versions or chapters in that book. I like it. Let's All do right. it. Well, Dan, speaking of chapters, um, where this is the chapter of the show where we normally uh, thank our friends, the band five year mission without whom, uh, we just wouldn't have the amazing music um, that that complements Trek Geeks every single week. We're so grateful to them for the use of their music. And we're so grateful to them uh, uh, to have them as friends. Um, we love everything they do. We want everyone to head on out to fiveyearmission.net. Download all our albums. Really, just go do it. Um, because you are going to become a huge fan just as Dan and I are. So it's fiveyearmission.net. Go score all the songs. Year one. Year two. Year three. Dare I say year four? Bill. Say it. Say it. Year four. Soon to be year five from what we saw recently on Facebook posting. <laughs> I know. Trouble with Tribbles and Spock's Brain. That's a lot of albums and a lot of songs. That's a lot of stuff. You Lots. know what I like? You know, it's like a season of an episode or a season of a series, I should say. 
You know what I like about seasons? I like season five of Deep Space Nine, Bill. It had it all. It had Klingons, changelings, the war against the Dominion. It even had Tribbles, if you remember correctly. I do. You know, but that season started with a secret and dangerous mission. A very dangerous five-year mission, you might say. That's oh, boy. Yeah. When the band members disguise themselves as Klingons to uncover that changeling infiltrator, you know things are going to get dicey. It is the amazing season five premiere of Deep Space Nine, Fark Apocalypse Rising. Bum, bum, bum. Green giant. No, wrong. Sorry, wrong one. <laughs> what? Have you been drinking? <laughs> I wish. I've been coughing. I wish. I wish I've been drinking for this one. Oh my Fark god! Apocalypse rising, yeah. Fark apocalypse rising. Uh, so hey. he, earlier today, you attempted to promote Andy Fark to executive producer, <laughs> um, and I'm just you keep bringing stuff like this to the table that could happen. I'm just going to throw it out. There. Yes, yes. It's amazing how typing the wrong one letter can really just bring the house down. <laughs> yeah, way to go. Way to go, Dabgers book. <laughs> uh, don't forget you can support trek geeks and the trek geeks network of podcast by subscribing to bonus content via patreon you can get access to our carpool conversations videos which we just have so much fun doing on the commute to work plus other exclusive content see the first of our annual supporters pins from fan sets huge thanks to lou and everybody there for the beautiful job they did on those pins we're so proud of them and of course check out our exclusive pod fleet t-shirt along with so many other perks Absolutely. And we want to take a moment now to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. We are so grateful for their support. And those folks include Adam Sanders, Brandon Everidge, Heather Sohn, John Krikorian, Peter Craig, Rick Tatro, Trey Womack, Shane Murray, Sean Lint. The list just keeps growing, Bill. It really Tim, does. <laughs> Tim Robertson, Tim Serdar, Vikram Bhatt, Greg Rozier, and the one, the only, Andy Fark. Pretty soon we're going to need a separate podcast just to list the associate producers and producers of Trek Geeks, <laughs> names we are all proud to read every single week. Uh, we also want to thank the producers for this episode of Trek Geeks for their support. They are Ken Tripp, Casey Shafsky, Charlie Mulvey, Chris Trebuzio, Craig Ewing, Eric Extreme, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Leonel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Mike Bovia, Harry Michelson, Norman Lau, Patrick Escudero, Sean O'Halloran, and of course, the lovely and talented Scott Vashon. If you'd like to become a producer on the network or even get access to the raw audio for Trek Geeks episodes, head on over to patreon.com slash Trek Geeks. Next week, buddy, our discussion is not going to focus on an episode. It's not going to focus on a character. It won't even focus on a series, but yet it's a topic that, especially now at this moment in time, encompasses all of Star Trek, and it's one that is really needed. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more, partner. Uh, this is something that we really have strong feelings about, and we feel it's time to share those thoughts and feelings. So next week, we're going to have a serious discussion about how to be a Star Trek fan and what that actually means. It should be very interesting, my friend, and it'll happen right here next week on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Looking forward to this one. It's another discussion that's long overdue. That's how to be a Star Trek fan next week on Trek Geeks. Of course, Dan, for more great Star Trek discussion, we want everyone to check out the Tricorder Transmissions. They are online at the thetricordertransmissions.com. And of course, for all the news on all the Star Treks, yo, please visit our great friends at Trek News. Dot net. For now, this has been episode number 172 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Wear an orbit around Gamma Coconut too, right? Uh, that's Gamma Coconut 2, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. A slip of the top. I've got the heart and I've got the Remy. Is that, it's, he, he just, I'm done. Shut up. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing one song for each episode of the original series. Download their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks, a Star Trek podcast, is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producer, Bill Smith.
For even more Star Trek discussion, check out Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and DiscoveringTrek.com. Bing bong! Bing bong. What? Bing bong. What? I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm testing out my American Express talking, talking guy. Federal Express? Federal Express. Federal Express, whatever, American Express, I don't know. Which some people may not know is what FedEx actually stands for. <laughs> that's, that's true because it's changed over time. See, look at that. We are also, we are entertainment, but we are also education. Thanks we're for adding, joining us, listeners. We're adding value. You're adding value. Uh, some might say that's the first time ever. Well, I know I don't add anything. I'm just, you know, whatever. Was, wow, I threw, I actually just threw myself in front of a speeding bus. I know. And you pushed me out of the way and said, no, I'm getting in front of the bus, mister. I saved you. I, and I'm, I'm glad to do it because yeah. I just care about you that much. Oh my God. You're making me ill. This is such crap. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> Hey, Gronk retired. Uh, I'm okay with it. You know, I am too, but it's sad. It's nine years. The guy has, has played his, his butt off. Yeah. Um, he's been hurt significantly yeah. the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got three, three rings. I don't know. They got, I don't know. They got eight, 10. I don't, I don't even know, but uh, he's okay. got a hundred rings. With this. <laughs> and, uh, he's, he's earned it. You know, I, I would love to retire at 20. I would have loved to have retired at 29 because I'm a lot older than that now. Yes. That would have been good. I would have loved if you retired that uh, long ago too, because then we wouldn't have to commute all the time. Oh my God. We're old enough to be Rob Gronkowski's father. Yeah, that Dan, was me fainting. I just passed out. <laughs> That's yeah, that is a little scary when you think about it. Oh my, he's twenty nine. He's a baby. He actually looks a little like you, Bill. Hmm. <laughs> it's my chiseled features. <laughs> Contained under all this fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm gonna cough. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hit mute fast enough. <laughs> you know, I I like abs, but have you heard of stuff crust stuff crust pizza? <laughs> that stuff's delightful. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. My wife actually saw that on a shirt online and I said, I need that shirt <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the gym. Speaking of shirts, may I say your selection for the flight out to Vegas this year is pretty damn cool. My friend, that's actually my wife's selection. Mm-hmm. So last year, um, she and well, Abby, our dog gets me a gift for Christmas every year. And she gets Kelly a, a gift too. It's amazing because she doesn't even have opposable thumbs. I know. She can use Amazon. She's the most talented dog ever. She is. And last year, um, uh, Kelly and Abby got me the shirt of, uh, it looks like the Beatles Abbey Road cover, except right. it's Kirk Spock, um, McCoy and Scotty. Uh, and I wore that to STLV uh, mm-hmm. for, on the plane and for day one last year. And so I told my wife that we're starting a new tradition and this year she has to buy me a, a shirt for the plane. And so she said, Okay. So mm-hmm. she went on to uh, amazon.com slash Star Trek and found a shirt and she bought it and she surprised me with it. So I have no idea what she's ordered until I see it. Yeah. In my hands. And it's almost, uh, it looks like an eighties arcade game with the, looks like, uh, yeah, Enterprise it looks like fighting Klingons. Looks like Galaga. I was just going to say, it looks like Galaga. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's fantastic. I can't wait to uh, wear that shirt on the plane. It's going to be awesome. You're going to look pretty styling because I'm not sure what I'll be wearing. Oh, what am I kidding? It's going to be Discovering Trek or a Trek Geek shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you ever bring to us. Because that's all I have in my – okay. I was in my closet the other day, and I have like 16 golf shirts. All but two are Discovering Trek or Trek Geeks. <laughs> I, I like to change it up because I wear more than that to work. I usually wear yeah. plain golf shirts. Like, you know, today you might think this was one of my Trek Geeks one, but it's not. It's actually one of my plain – Right. Uh, golf shirts because I pretty much wear golf shirts all the time. Um, but I I was going through my closet the other day and realized I have more Trek Geeks logo items just for repping the podcast than I do just about anything else. I just rethought that really quick. I actually have five non Trek Geek shirts. I have two Disney, a Patriots, and two American flag oh, yeah. uh, statues from Washington D.C. type ones that I always get compliments on those. Don't you have a Red Sox one too? Not anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got a little bit too tight. (laughs) (laughs) Stuffed crust pizza. (laughs) God, it's amazing. (laughs) I don't even like Pizza Hut pizza. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, okay. This is going to shock you and probably a lot of people. I'm not a pizza person. 
I don't like pizza that much. Really? Maybe, maybe two slices whenever we have pizza. It's I'm just fun about this. I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's because of so much bread or anything like that. I'm just, I've never been a huge pizza person. Lately, we eat cauliflower crust pizza, which you wouldn't think would be good, but man, it's delicious. Nice. Um, it it, it all has a little bit of a hint of cauliflower flavor, but um, you know, if we want pizza, we toss a couple of those in the oven. We have a little bit of extra cheese, and it's it's. I gotta say, it's light. Um, you know, it's not really heavy, so you don't have all that bread in your in yeah. your system, and it's a it's pretty fantastic. I'm looking forward to doing some on the grill this year with uh with with a pizza stone. I think that'll be pretty awesome. Cauliflower is like the rage right now. Cauliflower is in everything. You get cauliflower rice, cauliflower fries. We actually like to do something where we take a cauliflower and we actually microwave it in water for a little while and then it comes out. And then we have this special mixture of mayonnaise and mustard that we like paint the whole thing on. And then we dump a whole thing of shredded cheese on it and cook it a little bit more. We call it brain. <laughs> brain and brain. What is brain? Exactly. That's because that, when, you, when you slice into it, when it's all soft, it looks like a brain. So we have brain for dinner every once in a while. The Trek Geek Cooking Show coming to your computer in 2022. <laughs> That's nice. A little mixology, little food. I like it. I actually think we could kill that. I think that would be awesome. I'm I'm up for that. The Neelix cookbook has got nothing on us. <laughs> Please. The Neelix isn't even fat. Show me a show me a thin <laughs> chef that knows his food. He's not happy. Right. right. So yeah, exactly. I like imagine what, with this. Imagine what two fat Trek geeks could do. Oh, God. On Triple D. <laughs> <laughs> Diners, drive-ins, and Dan Davidson. <laughs> That's four Ds. Oh, Guy Fieri's not bright. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I might point out, he's he's a guy who cooks. He's not a mathematician. He's not. He doesn't work for NASA. <laughs> True. True that. <laughs> yes. So is Guy Fieri going to make an appearance in Vegas this year? Uh, it's always a possibility. Or I should say... <laughs> faux guy fieri before faux people guy. think guy fieri uh, <laughs> guy, F- yeah. <laughs> guy faux yeah um it, it is a possibility i always uh i always keep him close uh, to me in case he needs to make an appearance so yeah we'll see well all right i got other things i'm worrying about for cosplay this year baby mm-hmm. yeah you do <laughs> Uh, my job that day really is just to hold all your stuff right and to take pictures for you i, well, I know what my role is uh, speaking of which hold on one second Dan has just stepped away. He's I decided a jerk. to make a well. This is something that all the listeners would like to. I decided to make a special poster for autographs, and it came in today. That, oh, that's nice. That is the uh, that awesome image of Discovery season two that Trek Core came out with. I decided to make that a poster so I can have some of the folks autograph it at STLV. So I'm pretty happy. That'll be fantastic. Mm-hmm. I wish you'd heard what I said about you when your headphones were off. I'm sure it was lovely. I will hear it in uh, just a few hours time. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe. All right. You ready to do this? You got it, buddy. Let's go. Coconut. 